In this section, I want to cover normal examination and basic signs, both normal and abnormal, of the cerebellar proprioceptive system and the sensory system. As in the sections on the cranial nerves and motor system, my emphasis will be on signs and syndromes and not on diseases themselves. Coordination of the upper limbs is carried out by finger nose test. Put your finger on your nose. Put it down. I'll try the other one. Now do it with your eyes closed. In carrying out this test, it is noted whether the movement is carried out smoothly with tremor and with good coordination. Now hold out your arm. The special type of coordination is tested in pronation supination test. Turn over and back quickly. You'll notice that the beat is maintained on both sides, that the movement is smooth, and that there is no drifting of the arms. This is a perfectly normal performance. A variant of this test is carried out by patting. Now pat my hand. This is a test which does not depend on handedness, and one can get a good idea of incoordination as a result of this test, watching the rhythm and feeling the rhythm and amplitude of the movement. The lower limbs coordination is examined by heel-knee test. Put your heel on your knee. In the normal test, the heel is brought to the knee smoothly and with accuracy. Now I'll try the other one. Put it down. This can be done with the eyes closed as well. Close your eyes. Now I'll try the other one. This man has cerebellar dyssynergia involving the right arm, and he illustrates the fact that you may have fractional symptoms or signs involving the cerebellar system, just as in systems involving other parts of the nervous system. Hold out your arms. Turn them over and back. You'll notice that as he pronates and supinates his arms, the right arm swings out farther. It tends to droop a little, and the beat is lost as compared with the normal left arm. All right, fine. Now, pat my hand. You'll notice that there is a difference in amplitude and rhythm in patting the right hand. Try the left one. And that there is no such disturbance on the left. This has nothing to do with handedness. It is purely the result of his cerebellar disturbance. Put your finger on your nose. Notice that he has a little terminal tremor involving the uh, right hand, an intention tremor, which is not present on the left, and which is frequently present, of course, in cerebellar disease. The cerebellar signs are not dependent on sensory deficit. Close your eyes. Am I putting your thumb up or down? Up. That's right. Where is that? Down. That's right. Where is that? Down. Correct. Is this up or down? Up. And now? Down. And now? Down. That's right. In this instance, the incoordination of the arms is well illustrated by the rapid alternating test or pronation supination test. Will you hold out your arms, please, both of them? Now turn them over and back quickly till I ask you to stop. You'll notice that the beat is quite irregular in both arms, but more so in the left. Keep on, please. Very good. Now, pat by hand. And in this patting test, you'll notice that the beat is irregular, that the amplitude varies. It's even more pronounced on the left side. This is due to the dissociation of the dyssynergia of the limbs as a result of cerebellar disease. Man has a good deal of incoordination of his uh, legs, but in contrast, he has much less of his arm. Put your finger on your nose. Hold it up there, please. You'll notice that he fumbles a little, but on the whole is accurate. Put it down, please. Now try the other one. He has a little in intention tremor in his last movement, but it is not very great. Put it down, please. I show you this in order to emphasize the fact that the signs of cerebellar disease are not always 
fully expressed in all parts of the body and that they may be pronounced in some areas and absent in others. The incoordination of the limbs in cerebellar disease is associated with difficulty in measuring distance or dysmetria and often with tremor. Here it is shown in the heel knee test. Put your right heel on your left knee. You'll notice that he has a coarse intention tremor after he reaches his goal. Put it down, please. Try it once more. He overshoots, then comes back to the knee with this coarse tremor. Now try it with the other leg. You'll notice that it is not as pronounced on the left leg as it is on the right. One of the features of cerebellar disease is tremor, intention tremor, or tremor that is brought on by movement. You'll notice in the demonstration that I will give you that the tremor of the cerebellar type is associated with very marked incoordination, but that eventually the patient reaches his goal and is able to maintain his finger on his nose in the finger-to-nose test. You notice also a tremor of the head uh, which is part of the uh, tremor of the cerebellar disease. Will you put your finger on your nose? In spite of the marked incoordination, he is able to reach his goal, unlike the patient with posterior column disease, who cannot do so. You'll notice also that there is no change on cutting out light, on closing the eyes. This has no effect on cerebellar disease, while it does in the ataxia of posterior column disease. Close your eyes, touch your nose. Now, will you try it with the other hand, with your eyes open first, please? No, with your eyes closed. He has very little involvement of the opposite side. Now, will you tell us how your trouble began and when it began? Well, I'll say ten years ago I was a milkman and uh, everyone would laugh at the way I walked. I walked like a drunk. And then every six months we would get an, a company examination. So the doctor, when he was examining me, told me he wished he had my strength. That's fine, Morris. The speech in this case is a typical example of a cerebellar speech. It is slow, scanning, dysarthric, and it is associated with incoordination of the vocal musculature, similar in all respects to the dyssynergia of the systemic musculature. The cerebellar signs in this case are associated with multiple sclerosis. Here is a typical example of a cerebellar gait. Will you walk forward for us, please? Notice the widened base, the way he kicks forth his legs and tends to stagger and throwing himself off balance. Great difficulty in keeping his balance and turning around. And notice also the fact that his legs kick out and he is unsteady, but he holds his trunk quite stiffly. The incoordination of the cerebellar gait and the incoordination of the limbs is not dependent on sensory disturbances of any sort. Close your eyes. Just tell me if you are, I am bending your toe down or up. Tell me, please. Down. Where is that? Up. Where is that? Up. And where is that? Up. Down. Where is that? Down. He has good proprioception, and he has no sensory disturbance. The symptoms of cerebellar disease are characterized by disturbances of movement, by incoordination referred to as dyssynergia, which may affect a single limb all the limbs, the trunk alone, and even speech, and by tremor of a special sort brought out on movement and referred to as intention tremor. No sensory deficit is present in cerebellar disease, 
unlike the disturbance of sensation found in posterior column disease. The disturbances are the same in all parts of the cerebellar system from spinal cord to brainstem and cerebellum. Their localization is usually determined by neighborhood signs. Cerebellar signs are always ipsilateral to the lesion. The diagnosis of cerebellar disease may be made on the basis of the fully developed syndrome, but more important is the diagnosis by fractional signs. Thus, the dyssynergia of a single limb, intention tremor of one arm, or impairment of balance in standing or walking may indicate early multiple sclerosis or brain tumor to take a few isolated examples. Important test for proprioceptive system function is the Romberg sign. This is tested for by placing the feet close together and determining whether the station is steady. It is then tested with the eyes closed Close your eyes, please. And the same observations made. In a typical Romberg sign, the loss of balance is greatly increased by closing the eyes. Open your eyes. Now stand on one foot. Balance is tested first on one foot. Now try the other. Then on the other. It is sufficient to test it with the eyes open because with the eyes closed, it is a difficult test even under normal circumstances. Now put one foot directly in front of the other. This is the tandem Romberg position. Now put the other foot forward. And this is tested also with the other foot forward. Now walk with your heel against your toe. The balance of the trunk, the balance of the body, proper coordination, all of these are noted. And evidence of inability to maintain balance or evidence of staggering are observed. Finally, deep sensation may be examined. Keep your eyes closed. Tell me if I bend your thumb down or up. Down. Up. Up. Notice that I grasp the digit by the side to give him no lead. Tell me as soon as you feel your thumb moving. Moving. Up or down? Moving down. Am I bending your toe down or up? Down. Up. Up. Down. Vibration sense is examined by means of a C128 tuning fork. Is that vibrating? Yes and various parts of the bony skeleton may be sampled. Do you feel that? Yes. Is this vibrating? No. Yes. Tell me when this stops. Stopped. Is that vibrating? Yes. Tell me when it stops. Stopped. Is this vibrating? No. Vibrating. Vibrating. A posterior column constitute an important and integral part of the proprioceptive system. These columns become diseased under a great many circumstances. Multiple sclerosis, postrolateral sclerosis, in, uh, spinal cord tumor, and in uh, other conditions. The symptoms of involvement of these columns are characterized by disorders of movement and incoordination of movement described as ataxia. This ataxia, unlike the incoordination of movement in cerebellar disease, is dependent upon a sensory deficit, a loss of proprioception in joints and muscles and tendons. Let me demonstrate on this patient. Put your heel on your knee. You will notice the uncertainty of the movement and the dysmetria in attempting to reach her goal. Now put this heel on the other knee. She tends to overshoot, she's uncertain, and she has some waggling or tremor of uh, movement. This ataxia is dependent upon a sensory deficit 
a loss of proprioception. Close your eyes. Is your toe pointing up or down? I can't tell. Where is it? I don't know. Where is that? I don't know. And that? I don't know. There's complete loss of sensation in the joints of her large toes. You feel that vibration? No. No. Vibration is conducted in part through the posterior columns. Do you feel that vibration? No. You feel it there? No. This too is lost. Now keep your eyes closed and put this heel on your knee. Put it, put it back. Now try the other one. The disorder is somewhat increased by closing the eyes, which is characteristic of involvement of this system. This is an extreme example of the ataxic type of gait found in posterior column disease. Notice the tendency to lift the legs high and to slap the feet down in order to send impulses through the impaired joint sensation. Sensory examination consists of an examination of the chief modalities, touch, pain, heat, cold, position and vibration senses. There are special forms of sensation that may be studied as well. Heat and cold sensations are tested by these steel tubes which conduct heat and cold very rapidly. They're filled with cold water and with hot water. Is that warm or cold? Warm. And that? Warm. Cold. Cold. Warm. Warm. Cold. Warm. Warm. Cold. An accurate sampling can be obtained in this way. In testing pain sensation, an ordinary pin may be used. Is that sharp or dull? Sharp. Dull, dull, sharp, sharp, dull, sharp, sharp, dull, sharp, sharp. The various parts of the body may be quickly examined in this way. After this qualitative aspect is examined, one may examine the two sides of the body. Is there any difference between this and this? No. 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 Of course, in a subject with neurological disease, with sensory disturbances, one is guided by the complaints of the patient, and uh, various parts of the body may be examined for sensory disturbance uh, as a result of this. Touch sensation is best examined by a quick touch with the tip of the finger. Close your eyes. Tell me when you feel, just say yes when you feel me touch you. Yes. 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 The rhythm should be interrupted. Yes. Yes. And a little tremor helps because it helps. Yes. In delivering yes. a very light touch. Yes. Yes. In disease of the posterior roots, the sensory loss follows a dermatome pattern. 
This is usually difficult to demonstrate because of the overlap of dermatome areas. In this patient, the loss of sensation involves several dermatomes as a result of posterior root disease associated with herpes zoster. This is a typical example of a peripheral sensory syndrome and shows the characteristic sensory loss in the case of ulnar nerve involvement. In this instance, an ulnar neuritis from pressure at the elbow. Here you see loss of pain and touch sensations along the ulnar side of the palm, the little finger, and the external portion of the ring finger. Turn your hand over. The same pattern is repeated here. This is a typical example of sensory loss with involvement of the ulnar nerve. Let me illustrate the loss of sensation here. Tell me where you feel this pinpoint. Sharp. Once again. Sharp. Do you feel this? No. Do you feel that? Yes. Let me show you a typical example of a complete transverse spinal cord lesion. This is a lady with a hematomyelia, with complete interruption of the spinal cord at about T5 level. Notice the position of the feet, which are in plant flexion because she cannot hold them in the dorsal position. Can you move your foot up? No, I can't. Can you bend your leg? No. The muscles are wasted as a result of disuse and probably other factors. The legs are completely flaccid in spite of the fact that this has persisted for over a month. The reflexes are still absent. I can feel that, Doctor. She has no plantar reflex. She has complete loss of sensation. Close your eyes. Which way am I bending your toe? I don't know, Doctor. I can't tell. Can you tell? No, Doctor. No. I'm pressing very hard and she still cannot get sensation. Vibration sense is lost. You feel that? No, Doctor. You feel that? No, Doctor. And lost also at higher levels, which I will not take the trouble to demonstrate. In addition to this, let me now show you the level of the pain lesion. You feel this? No, Doctor. Tell me where you begin to feel the pinpoint. Here at this level, she begins to feel pinprick for the first time. Here is an example of a spinothalamic tract lesion in the spinal cord at T6 on the right side, resulting in loss of pain, heat, and cold below the level of the lesion on the opposite side. Tell me when you feel this pinprick. Now. You'll see that she begins to feel at this level. Is this hot or cold? Can you tell? No. What is that? That's hot. What is that? Hot. And that? I don't know. Can you tell me where it begins to feel hot? Now. She feels it at a slightly higher level than uh, pinprick, about one segment higher at T5. Is this hot or cold? It's cold. And this? I can't tell. Can you tell me where this is? Where it feels cold? There. This is just about in between, between the pain level and the heat level. So that she has loss of pain, heat and cold at T5 to T6. This patient with occlusion of the vertebral artery, the posterior inferior cerebellar branch, illustrates the pattern of spinothalamic sensory loss in lesions in the medulla. On one side of the body, there is loss of pain and temperature sensation to the neck. And on the side of the occlusion, there is loss of pain sensation over the face, 
since the spinal root of the trigeminal nerve has not yet crossed over to join the spinothalamic tract. Disease of the ventrolateral nucleus of the thalamus is associated with loss of all forms of sensation involving the opposite side of the body and including the face and head. This is well shown in this patient who has loss of pain, heat, cold, position and vibration senses over one side of the body following occlusion of the posterior cerebral artery. This is the straight leg raising test. It is an important test for cases with pain down the leg. And it is associated with actual stretching of the upper sacral root. This is a man with a herniated lumbar disc with limitation of movement by straight leg raising test. As I elevate his leg, there comes a point where it becomes uncomfortable to proceed further. And this limitation of movement is usually proportional to the degree of pain. You'll notice that on the other side, there is no difficulty whatever in raising his leg completely. In routine investigation of the nervous system, examination of the meninges is important. Flexion of the neck is usually free. Under some circumstances, it is restricted uh, because of meningeal irritation. In this instance, there is marked neck stiffness with inability to bend it because of meningeal irritation associated with the subarachnoid hemorrhage. I hope I have succeeded in demonstrating the signs and symptoms of the cerebellar and posterior column syndromes and of the various types of sensory disturbances at various levels of the nervous system, peripheral, spinal cord, and brainstem.